Thank you so much for joining us today at Comic-Con's Once Upon a Baker's Dozen, Fantastic Tales Teased in Two Minutes. During this panel, you will hear from 13 authors uh, working in the fantasy and fantasy-inspired field, uh, sharing with you a quick teaser two-minute description of their latest work and also the answer to two questions in our quickfire round. What is your favorite fantasy trope? And what is your favorite fantasy food or beverage? All of the author's books are available for order or pre-order from, from Comic Comet at Home, Bookseller Mysterious Galaxy, or wherever books are sold. Let me introduce you to our participants. Uh, Victoria Aviard was born and raised in East Longmeadow, Massachusetts, a small town known only for the worst traffic rotary in the continental United States. She moved to Los Angeles to earn a BFA in screenwriting at the University of Southern California. Victoria currently splits her time between the East and West Coasts. As an author and screenwriter, she uses her careers as an excuse to read too many books and watch too many movies. Victoria's latest book is Realm Breaker. Nafisa Azad. Born in Fiji, Nafisa is a self-identified island girl and dreams of existing solely on mangoes and pineapple. Currently in British Columbia, she reads too many books, watches too many K-dramas, and writes stories about girls taking over the world. Her debut young adult novel was the Morrison-nominated The Candle and the Flame. The Wild Ones is her current novel and her second. Peter V. Brett is the New York Times bestselling author of the Demon Cycle series, which has sold more than two and a half million copies in 25 languages worldwide. Pete's novels include The Warded Man and The Core, and in addition to his novels, he's written a series of novellas set in the Demon Cycle world. Pete also wrote the Red Sonia Unchanged graphic novel for Dynamite Comics. His latest is The Desert Prince. Tanaz Bathania writes books for young adults. Her fantasy novel, Hunted by the Sky, was named a Best Book of the Year by the CBC and USBBY and is the first of a YA fantasy duology set in a world inspired by medieval India. Her novel, The Beauty of the Moment, won the Nautilus Gold Award for Young Adult Fiction and has also been nominated for the Ontario Library Association's White Pine Award. Her acclaimed debut, A Girl Like That, was named a Best Book of the Year by numerous outlets, including the Globe and Mail, 17 and the Times of India. She lives in Ontario with her family and her latest is Rising Like a Storm. JL is the author of the instant New York Times and indie bookseller bestseller Wings of Ebony, a young adult novel about a black teen who must lean into her ancestors magic to protect her inner city community from drugs, violence and crime. Ms. Magazine calls it the debut fantasy we need right now. A former educator and first generation college student, when she's not writing, Elle can be found mentoring aspiring writers, loving on her three littles, or cooking up something true to her Louisiana roots. Once again, her book is Wings of Ebony. Nicole Glover. Nicole Glover works as a UX researcher in Virginia. She believes libraries are magical places and problems seem smaller with a cup of tea in hand. I am inclined to agree. Her life outside of books includes bicycles, video games, and baking the perfect banana bread. The Conductors is Nicole's debut novel. Ayana Gray is an author of speculative works and lovers of all things monster, mythos, and melanin magic technically hashtag melanin magic. Originally from Atlanta, she now lives in sunny Florida where she reads avidly, follows Formula One racing and worries over her adopted baby black rhino, Apollo. Birds of, Play, Birds of Prey is her debut novel. 
Elizabeth Lim grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she was raised on a hearty diet of fairy tales, myths, and songs. Before becoming an author, Elizabeth was a professional film and video game composer. She still tends to come up with her best book ideas when writing near a piano. An alumna of Harvard College and the Juilliard School, she now lives in New York City with her husband and daughter. As well as writing original novels like Six Crimson Cranes, Elizabeth is also a contributor to the New York Times bestselling A Twisted Tale series. Julie Murphy is the New York Times bestselling author of several books, including Dumplin', now a Netflix original movie starring Jennifer Aniston. She lives in North Texas with her husband, dogs, and cats. Her book is Meant to Be, If the Shoe Fits. Shelley Parker Chan is an Asian Australian former diplomat who worked on human rights, gender equality, and LGBT rights in Southeast Asia. Raised on Greek myths, Arthurian legend, and Chinese tales of suffering and tragic romance, her debut novel, She Who, Become, Who Became the Sun, owes more than a little to all three. Ava Reed was born in Manhattan and raised right across the Hudson River in Hoboken, New Jersey, but currently lives in Palo Alto, California. She has a degree in political science from Barnard College, focusing on religion and ethno-nationalism. She's worked for a refugee resettlement organization, for a U.S. Senator, and most recently for an AI robotics startup. The Wolf and the Woodsman is her first novel. Laura Sebastian grew up in South Florida and attended Savannah College of Art and Design. She now lives and writes in London. Laura is the author of the New York Times bestselling Ash Princess series, and her new book is Half Sick of Shadows. Tasha Suri was born in London to Punjabi parents. She studied English and creative writing at Warwick University and is now a cat-owning librarian in London. A lover of period Bollywood films, history, and mythology led her to write South Asian-influenced fantasy. The Jasmine Throne is Tasha's latest. So thank you all. And without for joining us, without further ado, let's hear from our authors. Hi, my name is Nafiza Azad, and I am the author of The Candle and the Flame and the upcoming The Wild Ones. The novel is about a group of girls collectively known as the Wild Ones. They are the survivors of some of the worst things that can happen to girls, to women, to anyone out there. The travel, the um, cities of the world via a magical corridor known as the Between. On a trip to Jabal, Lebanon, they come across a boy called Tarana, who made it possible for them to access the Between. Tarana is in danger as he's being pursued by creatures who want to steal his magic for their own. The Wild Ones decide to help Tarana, because if Tarana isn't safe and free, neither are they. And that is a fate the Wild Ones refuse to accept ever again. Here's a teaser from the book, an introduction to the Wild Ones. We are the Wild Ones. We are made of whimsy and lemon. We have the temerity to be not just women, but women of color. Women with melanin in our skin and voices in our throats. Voices that will not be vanquished, not now, not ever. We will not be silenced. Hi, I'm Victoria Aviard. I am the author of Realm Breaker. Um, and for me, this book was very much a love letter to who I was as a maladjusted, nerdy 14 year old who totally loved Lord of the Rings, but, you know, wasn't exactly seeing herself in Lord of the Rings in the fellowship. So I sort of wrote my own classic fantasy adventure that I felt like I could go on or other people could feel a part of. Um, and this book starts with a question, and that question is what happens when the heroes fail? What happens when the JV team has to step up to save the world? Um, and in the case of Realm Breaker, it happens to include a pirate's teenage daughter and a band of misfits and criminals who would otherwise never see themselves 
as heroes, but uh, have to become them to save the world. I call it Lord of the Rings meets Guardians of the Galaxy. And that's Realm Breaker. Hi to everyone at Comic-Con. My name is Tanaz Bhatena and I'm the author of Hunted by the Sky and its upcoming sequel, Rising Like a Storm, which releases on June 22nd of this year. This is a young adult fantasy duology set in a world inspired by medieval India and follows the story of a girl named Gul who has been prophesied to be the downfall of a tyrant king. When Gul's parents are murdered by the king's soldiers, she barely manages to escape and is taken in by a group of rebel women called the Sisterhood of the Golden Lotus who train her in warrior magic. By the time she turns 16, Gul has only one thought in mind, and that is revenge. She eventually manages to infiltrate the king's palace with the help of a reluctant stable boy named Kavas, who has some dark secrets of his own. But what Gul and Kavas don't realize is that the palace has its own secrets, and that there is more to their burgeoning relationship than just romance. The bond between them and the magic they realize may be the only way to end their kingdom's tyrannical rule. And in Rising Like a Storm, they come across a new tyrant who's deadlier than any ruler they've ever known. To summarize it all, this series contains chosen ones, an enemies to lovers romance, fierce female warriors, magical creatures inspired by Indian and Persian mythology, and some very cranky ghosts. Hi, I'm Peter B. Brett, author of the internationally best-selling Demon Cycle series, which is published in 27 languages worldwide. You may be most familiar with the first book in the series, The Warded Man, also known as The Painted Man in the UK and Australia. The Demon Cycle follows the lives of 12 characters through humanity's last stand against bloodthirsty demons that come out at night seeking to destroy all life. At five books with four companion novellas, The Demon Cycle is complete and binge ready. However, in August of 2021, the next generation takes over. The Desert Prince is the first book in the Nightfall Saga, which will consist of three books. The Desert Prince opens up with a new cast and a new set of problems, so new readers can jump right in with no previous knowledge of the series. However, if you're a fan of the Demon Cycle, you will find that there are a lot of familiar faces lurking in the background, usually as parents who know just how dangerous adventures can be, trying to keep their children from making similarly reckless life choices. I hope you'll give them a try. Hi, I'm Shelley Parker Chan, and I have a book coming out from Tor in July called She Who Became the Sun. It's a queer reimagining of the rise to power of the founding emperor of the Ming Dynasty. In the 14th century, China had been conquered and was being ruled by the Mongols uh, pretty brutally. And along came this guy. Like, he was just a peasant, he was a nobody. His name was Zhu Yuanzhang. And he's just one of those guys who sees opportunity and goes for it. You know, he thought, you know what? I am destined for greatness. So he became a monk. He became a rebel commander. He built himself a mega army. He kicked the Mongols out of China and he became the emperor, which has to be one of the most phenomenal rises in all of human history. And I thought it'd be really fun if we took this guy of such monstrous ambition and made him someone who is not a man. You know, how would that story have been different? So I've written a story about a boy who's given a great fate and a girl who steals it. And the question becomes, you know, is that her fate to keep? Uh, will it be taken away from her? And what will she do to make sure it doesn't get taken away? Uh, it's a story that's modeled on Chinese TV dramas and films. And if you know that genre, you know they're just like super fun. They're full of revenge and betrayals and murder, and backstabbing and battles. And that's what I tried to do. I tried to make it fun. Um, while at the same time, I hope there's a message in there about gender and making the fate that you want for yourself. I'm JL, the author of Wings of Ebony the instant New York Times and indie bestseller, a duology about a teen from an inner city neighborhood who after her mother's murder is taken from home by her estranged father, major side eyes, to his home, Gazan. Gazan is a veiled island of magic wielders. And though far away from Rue's home, the two worlds are more connected than they seem. 
On the anniversary of Rue's mother's murder, she sneaks back home from the island. She sneaks back home to leave a gift for her little sister that she was forced to leave behind. But when her sister is almost killed in a car accident, Rue steps in to save her, revealing not only her presence there, but her magic too. What unfolds is a thrilling, heart-pumping, wildly inspiring story about a stubbornly determined demigoddess trying to protect her sister, and by extension, her home. Only to do so, she has to tap into her ancestor's magic and make peace with the man who abandoned her in the first place. Dun dun dun! The sequel to Wings of Ebony comes out in January by Simon & Schuster, so make sure you pick that one up as well, especially if you love love triangles. I freshened it up a bit, and I want to know what you think. So when you read, be sure you tag me on socials. Are you Team Julius or Team Jamal? Anyway, thanks for listening. I'm JL, and this is Wings of Ebony. Hello, my name is Nicole Glover. My novel, The Conductors, is a murder mystery with magic. I've always wondered what Underground Railroad conductors did after the Civil War ended, and the answer I landed on was solving mystery. The conductors followed Hetty and Benjamin Rhodes, who used their skills and talents they developed as conductors, along with their magic to solve mysteries in 1871 Philadelphia. They are quite good at it too, but their most difficult date case to date comes when an old friend is murdered. To find out the truth, they have to question friends, neighbors, and even themselves, and the secrets they find changes everything. Hi, my name is Ayana Gray and I'm the author of the upcoming book, Beast of Prey. It comes out September 28, 2021, and it is a young adult fantasy novel that follows two Black teens, one who is an aspiring warrior and the other who is a beast keeper at a magical zoo as they form a pretty reluctant alliance to venture into a magical jungle and hunt down the monster that's been menacing their city for close to 100 years. Now, I like to tell people that this is a story full of monsters, mythos, and of course, lots of magic, but it's also a story that has so many of the elements of young adult fantasy and fantasy that I really love. So you're going to see enemies to lovers and of course romance. There's going to be action, some scary stuff, definitely some comedy, definitely a yo mama joke in there once or twice and so many of the other things that I love in magical stories. I cannot wait for you to read it. I hope you love it as much as I do. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Lim. I'm the author of Spin the Dawn as well as two tales in the Disney Twisted Tales series. Today, I'd like to introduce you to my latest book, Six Crimson Cranes. Six Crimson Cranes is inspired by the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, The Wild Swans, and is about a princess named Shiori, whose six brothers are cursed into cranes by their sorcerer's stepmother. In order to break their curse, she must place her trust in a flying paper bird, a shape-shifting dragon, as well as a young lord she was betrothed to marry but rejected. The catch? She mustn't utter a sound until the curse is broken or one of her brothers will die. One of the things that I've always admired about the Wild Swans fairy tale is that the princess is a hero of her own right, choosing to undergo the many trials to save her brothers despite great personal cost to herself. Shiori in Six Crimson Cranes is just such a hero and writing stories about bold and resilient girls has always been a passion of mine as a writer, as well as weaving in tales from the West with the rich folklore and culture of Asia. Six Crimson Cranes is honestly my favorite book that I've ever written. Shiori has been such a fun character to get to know. She begins as this naive, slightly immature and slightly spoiled princess. And throughout the book, she goes on such a journey, um, not just to break the curse, but also her own personal journey that it's been a delight as an author to to get to know her and to get to experience her and put her in this magical world. Um, I'm really excited for readers to, to experience Six Crimson Cranes and to hopefully fall in love with it. I hope that this book will make you laugh and cry and swoon. It's got so much in it that I think readers will enjoy. There's um, mistaken identities, there's dragons, shape-shifting dragons from the deepest sea and flying paper birds and lots of food. There's piping hot fish soup and cakes in all different colors and sizes. There's a star-crossed swoon-worthy romance 
and I just really hope you guys love it. Hi, my name is Julie Murphy, and I'm the author of books you might have heard of, like Dumplin', Puddin', Pumpkin, uh, Faith Taking Flight, but I've got a really exciting new book coming out soon called If the Shoe Fits. It's my very first adult novel, which is really exciting. It's also a modern day romantic comedy retelling of Cinderella. Um, if the Shoe Fits follows Cindy, who is a recent fashion school graduate. She's feeling sort of aimless. She's still grieving the death of her father from a few years ago. And so rather than get an entry level position in the fashion business, she decides to return home and do some nannying jobs for her stepmother, who is this like high powered reality television producer. Uh, one night, Cindy finds out that because of, you know, a series of events, uh, there is an opening spot on her step on her mother stepmother's <laughs> reality TV show. And the reality TV show is called Before Midnight. It's sort of like this national sensation, a lot like a little show you might have heard of called The Bachelor. And Cindy decides to just go for it and take the spot on the reality TV show and see what happens. Um, what's really special about Cindy is she's got a passion for shoe design and she's also plus size. So this is sort of this revolutionary thing. It's the first time a plus size girl has been on this reality TV show. And not to mention she might have a secret connection with the suitor from before the show even began. So it's this really fun sort of flip on the Cinderella retelling. Um, you get to know Prince Charming a little bit better than you did in the original, I think. Uh, and it was a lot of fun to work on. I'm so excited to launch this. It's just the idea of getting to like retell Cinderella with the plus size protagonist feels so modern and relatable and something I hope a lot of you will enjoy as much as I did writing it. The Wolf and the Woodsman is my debut novel, and I would describe it as an epic but literary meaning fantasy inspired by medieval Hungarian history and Jewish mythology. It's set in a world where the country is still trying to define itself, and as a result, any aberrant element that doesn't fit within the aspirational nation state is violently suppressed or stamped out entirely. The story follows Evie Kay, who's part of one of these marginalized groups, but she's an outcast even in her own pagan village because she has Jewish heritage. Her Jewish heritage renders her magicless, unlike the other women in her village, so she's given up as a blood tithe to the woodsmen who are the king's holy order. But through an unfortunate and very gruesome turn of events, she ends up allying herself with one of the woodsmen, who is actually the disgraced prince. They are forced to rely on each other in order to survive a long, perilous journey to the capital, where they hope to take down his usurper brother, who is a zealous tyrant that threatens them both. Uh, the core of the book, I would say, is really about narrative and about the pain of exclusion. Both of the main characters are outcasts in their own ways, and they find solace in one another and eventually find a way to reclaim the hateful narratives that have been told about them or even write new narratives of their own. Um, and it's it's a bloody and brutal tale at times, but I do think it's ultimately a very hopeful one. Hi, my name is Laura Sebastian and my new book Half Sick of Shadows is a retelling of the legend of King Arthur from the point of view of an unexpected character, the cursed Lady of Shalott, aka Elaine of Astolat, aka Lancelot's wife. In my take on this age-old story, Elaine is a young oracle raised on the mystical island of Avalon alongside some familiar faces, Arthur, Guinevere, Lancelot, and Morgana. When Arthur's father dies and the six of them return to Camelot to help him claim his throne, the tragic events that Elaine has foreseen are put into motion and the cracks between this tight-knit group of friends begin to show. Elaine is determined to forge a new future, but even she can't predict what will happen when she's forced to choose between the happiness of her friends and the well-being of the world at large. If you're a longtime fan of Arthurian mythology, I hope you find something new to love in Elaine's story. And if you're new to these characters in this world, I hope you love them as much as I do. Either way, welcome to Albion. Hi, my name is Tasha Suri, and I'm the author of The Jasmine Throne, out from Orbit Books. The Jasmine Throne is a multi-point-of-view, Indian-inspired epic fantasy about a captive vengeful princess and a maidservant with hidden magic who have to work together to bring down the princess's tyrannical emperor brother, set an empire ablaze and fall in love along the way. It's humongously inspired by the religious texts and mythology and history that I grew up with. 
So I took particular inspiration for things like um, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. I always had really strong feelings about the women in those stories, um, what they suffered and their fury, their anger, the monstrous things that they did or didn't do. And I wanted to bring that um, perspective into an epic fantasy setting, which is something I hopefully have done. I also really wanted to write the kind of sapphic or lesbian love story that I'd always wanted to read, which is to say one that is hugely influenced by my Indian background, um, but also one that is about women who are very morally dubious and do terrible things in the name of power, um, who are not afraid to be monstrous, but also get to have this really epic sweeping love story. Um, it is a story that I am hugely proud of and I feel like it is really vast in scale um, with lots of point of views including a nameless prince, a rebel and a regent's wife among many many others. Um, I hope it's one that you'll really enjoy and I really feel like it's that perfect crossover of a, a very difficult and thorny romance with the huge politics and magical scale that we all love in epic fantasy. So that's all I want to say about the book and I really hope you read it and enjoy it. My favourite fantasy trope is a little obscure but I love the beautiful yet austere type of character who compensates for their past trauma or their perceived deficiencies by becoming powerful and cruel and feared by everyone and not letting anyone in. So like Daenerys from Game of Thrones, or Edelgard from Fire Emblem, or my personal favorite, General Young from my fellow panelist, Shelley Parker Chan's amazing debut, She Who Became the Sun. As for my favorite fantasy tropes, I have a lot, and Enemies to Lovers is one of my favorites. But I gotta say that my favorite fantasy trope of all time is probably the magical school, library, archives, whatever center center of magic. Um, and I think it's because thinking about a place of learning also being a place where there's real magic behind every corner, sometimes magic that's not meant to be discovered, sometimes magic that hasn't been discovered. I just think that's so fun. And, and so many of my favorite books feature these kinds of magical places within the story. Um, and I just love it so much. Uh, my favorite fantasy trope would have to be magical jewelry. Give me a good cursed amulet or invisibility ring and I am a happy reader. My favourite fantasy trope is um, the one where, oh, gods are real and walking among us and causing havoc. I, I know that one is very cliche, but I absolutely love it whenever I come across it in a book. It, it's just always a source of maximum chaos. My favourite fantasy trope, I'm really bad at favourites, to be honest. Um, I love lo love triangles. And so you'll see one in this duology, especially in book two. My favorite fantasy trope. So this is tough because I love a lot of tropes, as you can see by my book. But what I really love is the trope of gods or deities meddling in human affairs. This is something that I grew up watching as a kid, especially in Hindu mythology epics such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Uh, the author N.K. Jemisin mentioned being inspired by the three Hindu gods, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, while writing her famous Inheritance trilogy. But she also put her own stamp on the trope, which was really fantastic and well done. Of all the fantasy tropes out there, I have to say that my favorite one is when a multi-group of characters are out there discovering some lost treasure or a mystery. There's maps, there's puzzles, some ancient libraries, and maybe a little rewriting of history involved. Uh, as for my favorite fantasy trope, I feel like we're all suckers for, you know, enemies to lovers, and I love seeing that on the page. I love writing that on the page. I um, also love, love, love a training montage. There's nothing better than a training montage. I love it from uh, an audience standpoint. You just want to see the character get better at what they're doing. And I love it from a story craft standpoint because it gives me a little bit more room to move. If I show a couple of moments of them training, I feel like the audience will really follow me when a hundred pages later, they're suddenly really good at something. My favorite fantasy trope is sometimes romantic love isn't enough and sometimes love doesn't conquer all. 
you might have two people on opposite sides of the conflict and they do love each other, but there's something more important in their lives. They might have a, a duty or they might have to sacrifice themselves to save the world. So they'll never be together. I think my favorite fantasy trope is the character who's too stubborn to quit. I think we've all read a story where a character is clearly outmatched in a conflict and yet somehow through sheer stubbornness and force of will is able to pull victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, it's become something of a staple in my own stories. Uh, if there's anything that all of my main characters have in common is that they're all stubborn. One of my favorite fantasy tropes is the chosen one. My favorite fantasy trope is when characters, whether they're friends or lovers or almost lovers, have to research the quest that they're about to go on or the villain that they're about to fight and go to a library. And during that library scene, they get to know each other better and read. I think that I would have to say my favorite fantasy trope is the here comes the cavalry trope. Um, I love when like the surprise army who's going to save the day rides into battle at the very end. I feel like it happens in like, you know, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones. I mean, really my favorite fantasy trope is just literally anything Holly Black writes, but we'll go with here comes the cavalry. This is hard because I just love food in general. Um, I guess I would say Gree. Gree is a dish from Wings of Ebony and it is um, sort of like hot, hot cocoa, but it's made with like coconut milk or goat's milk and then it has a little orange zest in it, which I think just sounds delicious. I also really like the sound of um, Bilbo Baggins um, sea cakes. Yes, sea cakes. I've looked at the recipe once and it's very similar to my grandmother's tea cake recipe. So I'm sure it's delicious. My favorite fantasy food would probably be the cakes that Alice in Alice in Wonderland eats. Um, they're the cakes that make her bigger and smaller. I think they'd be a really useful thing to have in your pocket, especially as you go on your adventure. Um, as for a favorite fantasy drink, I'm gonna make one up and say, how about a mint tea that lets you change your appearance after you drink it? My favorite fantasy food is the peaches of immortality in Chinese mythology that grow in heaven. And they're the ones that monkey steals in Journey to the West, because if you eat one of those peaches, you'll live for 3000 years. They work pretty much exactly like the golden apples in Norse mythology. This is a really hard one, but, and I don't even know if this is a real answer, but I, since I was a kid, I've always been obsessed with the food and hook, the movie. Um, with Julia Roberts and Robin Williams. And like they have this fantasy food that they, it is like whatever they believe it to be. I think if I remember, I don't know, but I always remember obsessing over that and thinking it looked so good when I was a kid. There's an account on Twitter called Redwall Feastbot, which just tweets out descriptions of food from the Redwall series. So I would probably have to say anything from that. Um, I remember reading those books as a little kid and thinking that like, oh, maybe I should go try and eat a dandelion. Like they sound really good. My favorite fantasy food is dwarf bread um, from Terry Pratchett's Discworld. Every time I read a description of it as um, something you can look at that instantly makes you not particularly hungry because you can think of a thousand other things to eat, including your own foot. It just makes me start laughing. So absolutely my favorite fantasy food. I would say I have to go with the blue milk from Star Wars, because Star Wars is a fantasy, not a sci-fi, but who hasn't wanted to try the blue milk? And I have not gotten to Disney yet to do it myself, but I certainly will. Uh, so that's me. Thanks so much, Comic-Con. I hope to see you in person soon. My favorite fantasy food is actually the only one I have had the pleasure of eating, and that is Lambus bread from uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I think that my favorite fantasy food is stew. Despite all of the Diana Wynne Jones stands, they're gonna come after me and say accurately that it's impractical to stew meat over a campfire. Uh, to me, it embodies fantasy adventure in a way that's really tangible. When I was a kid, my mom had an amazing stew recipe and because I was accruing a debt that my children are now visiting on me, I refused to eat it. 
But then I started reading fantasy books and seeing characters eat stew all the time made me want to eat it too. And after that, it became one of my favorite meals. I've, I've got to be honest, I'm not a foodie, so that's a hard question for me, but I adore the Dababad trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty. And one of the reasons um, that I love those books so much is because um, Shan does such a great job with descriptions of everything, including food. And so basically any food that S.A. Chakraborty described or made up in those books, I would be happy to eat. My favorite fantasy food would be fairy cakes. Though I recently found out those are just cupcakes. But cupcakes are still great. So we're gonna go with fairy cakes. My favorite fantasy food Okay, I'm gonna date myself right now, but I really love all the food that Enid Blyton has in her Far Away Tree series. There are these cookies called pop biscuits, which go pop in your mouth and honey pours out. There are also Google buns, which are basically buns, but they have a current inside, and when you bite into the current, sherbet flows out. Um, okay, now I'm really, really hungry. <laughs> so thank you, Comic-Con. Take care. If I have to name a favorite fantasy food, it has to be Sinchu Beans from Dragon Ball Z. It is the ultimate pick-me-up type of food. You literally are beaten up at your, at your worst and pop that bean and you're ready to go. Once again, thank you all so much for joining us for this quick baker's dozen of 13 fantasy tales, tropes, and treats. We hope that this has inspired you to add all of the author's books to your to be read pile. Once again, thank you to Comic-Con at home and thank you for your time.